Welcome to ZBook Successful Authors Podcast. And with me, I have a dynamic young man who's absolutely crushing it and 10xing his business. His name is Derek Depker, and he's committed to empowerment, enlightenment, and compassion. He's a certified master NLP practitioner, a performance coach, and author of over six best selling books in personal development, self-help, fitness, and authorship. And this is the second time on his on my podcast. So let's do some breaking through with Derek Depker. How you doing, Derek? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Eric? Not bad, not bad. Uh, besides the weather, I'm. you're in LA, right? I am, but it's been a bit rainy here in LA recently. Okay, well, it's about time. You guys need some rain, right? All of those fires, right? Yeah, it's you know it's extremely dry, and uh, then when the fire, when we need the rain, it's not there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, don't need yeah. it. It is. Yeah. So, how's your business been doing? Uh, business is good. Been um, sure, as I'm sure we'll get into a lot on um, you know both myself, but also the authors I work with, really yeah. focusing heavily on Amazon ads. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they've been out for a couple years now, and. Mm -hmm worked amazingly when they first came out uh, competition mm -hmm. grew and yep. it got you know a little more challenging but I'm still finding with some strategies and things that is um, still making some good profit on the right types of books and the good news is Amazon's actually rolling out some new things on the, the ad platform so they're continuing to update it and give us authors more more things to play with I noticed they changed their dashboard, and at first it really made me mad. I have to learn it again. Uh, I'm looking for the advantages right now, but okay, enough about me. What has changed in your yeah, process with the Amazon ads since the last time we talked? Because, I mean, before it was easy. You just go to the Keyword Planner tool and dump in a bunch of keywords, and then, woo, you know. So what's changed since the last time we talked? Well, some of the basic principles are still there mm -hmm. uh, from the ads. Uh, you know, it's definitely going to be a test and see process. I I'd love to be able to say, um, you know, there's just one size fits all. You do this, it's always going to work. Uh, <laughs> that's, you know, of course, typically in business, not going to be the way it works. So, you know, sometimes books, they need a lower bid. Sometimes they need a higher bid uh, for different keywords and, and again, test and see. One of the things, though, that Amazon has rolled out is a suggested bid mm -hmm. feature. Uh, so in my testing, so it's one click of the button and it'll put in a suggested bid for uh, all the keywords that you have entered. And in my testing, this is definitely worth worth trying out. Again, sometimes this works really great and gets a good profit margin. Other times it's uh, just way too expensive. You know, hmm. it's too high. So uh, again, there's no one size fits all. But if you haven't explored that, if you haven't checked your ad dashboard recently, um, then that's that's something that you can test out to create a new ad using these suggested bids. Interesting. Um, another new thing I've noticed is this uh, bid optimization where it will automatically pump up your bid according to something. Have you seen that? I have. So I've started to explore and test some of the different bid optimizing features. And there's, there's bid plus. Um, ah, that's it. Yes. Yeah, there's bid plus which again, I test it. I do some ads with it, some ads without it, and I haven't noticed a consistent um, one being always better than the other. So if you haven't done a uh, bid plus campaign, the way I recommend testing this is, um, I like to let an ad run for at least a week and then you know, pause mm -hmm. it or stop it and then do another ad with all the same settings, but you change one thing. So let's say you have right. an ad going without bid plus, uh, then you copy that, and then the next week, all the same keywords, all the same bids, but now you do it with bid plus. And mm -hmm. you, you know, that's a way of doing this A-B comparison uh, between mm -hmm. uh, two different ads. Now, I think you'd get probably even better statistics if you let it run out for two weeks or so, because um, you know some weeks might fluctuate just naturally in terms of what people are searching for. But I think a week is, is long enough to, to get a general sense of uh, the difference between using using something like bid plus or not using it that's a really good tip because um i did that and it worked uh and you know i have all my uh, spreadsheets and i'm watching the roi and the cost and all of this stuff and uh um since i interviewed brian meeks i'm really into the uh, the conversion rate so i tried this bid plus and it, it worked on one of my books. So, and then, you know, it stopped working. So definitely experiment, 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 right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, um, that's, 
it's, it's part of the entrepreneur mindset in general is it's a test and see uh, yeah. process it, and it's an experiment mindset and it can actually be fun uh, to do that. And with ads, um, you know, some people are really in there every single day tracking a lot of stuff. And I mean, that's cool. If, if you like that, I tend to be a little bit more set and forget for a brief period of time. Again, mm -hmm. set it up for a week, let it do its thing, focus on other things in my life and business and then mm -hmm. come back and, and see what it does. But now that is something you definitely can't do with Facebook ads. Do you do those two and Amazon ads? I haven't done as uh, many Facebook ads. I've certainly mm -hmm. have in the past done a little bit and I've hired um, different people. Johnny Andrews uh, mm -hmm. does a lot with Facebook ads, especially mm -hmm. with uh, fiction authors. So he's helped, but that's more for uh, email opt-ins. That's for webinar, right. friends, things like that it, being in the non uh, fiction space. So, um, I mean, I definitely know that some fiction authors have done well uh, building their audience with, with Facebook ads. And I would say another general good practice, whether it's with Facebook ads or other things, is to be considering the long term, right? So it's whether that's driving people to the an opt-in page, so you're adding them to an email list and then you have an opportunity to market over the long term, or if it's driving them to a book that's part of a series and mm -hmm. now the idea is even if you don't make the money back on that, first mm -hmm. sale or even going to a perma free book if they get other books in your your series that's where some of the profit can come in so it's a little more complex it's not something that i teach but i know there's definitely some great trainings out there mm -hmm. on uh, doing facebook ads for authors so you hit a keyword there long term what is long term six months two months um, you can always break it down however you want. I mean, to me, long term is at least six to twelve months in terms of looking at what the what the income is. But uh -huh. if you're if you're in this as a business and as a lifestyle, I mean, long term is uh, you know one of the metrics is like you know lifetime customer value. Exactly, right? so, exactly. <laughs> That's what I was so getting on. Term, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, lifetime could be you know. Uh, however, however much longer you're doing this. So I think right. Amazon's going to be around for a little while, uh, but let's <laughs> just say 10 years or so. Um, obviously, it gets harder to to track that. And just human psychology being what it is, sometimes it's hard to go like, oh, well, this is going to pay for itself in seven and a half years. Uh, <laughs> that can be, uh, you know, I like to see an ROI a little quicker than that. Yeah, I like to see that it's, it's going to make its money back. So uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you can look over the next, you know, let's say year, I think is a good, period of time and be thinking about, okay, um, something I call the slingshot effect. Yeah. And the principle isn't new. It's just my terminology for it, where uh, if you imagine a slingshot, sometimes you're pulling back in the opposite direction of where you want whatever you're launching to go, hmm. right? Uh, bow and arrow kind of do the same thing. You're pulling away and launching it. So if you think about, I'll use a fitness, um, fitness analogy. When you go, if you want to get stronger, if you want to get stronger muscles, you know, people will go work out and do resistance training. Well, resistance training doesn't make you stronger. If you think about it, it actually makes you weaker huh. temporarily, right? If you've ever done like a heavy leg workout and then your legs feel like jelly. Oh, yeah, like yeah. You do a bunch of push-ups and then you, can, you can't lift yourself up anymore. Yeah. Resistance training makes you weaker huh. temporarily and then you get stronger after a period of time, right? It's the compensation. So a lot of times, you know, even for me, I kind of got that, but I was like, oh yeah, you get, you, you have to go through weakness to get strength. And it's this principle that shows up in so many areas of life. So in business, it means you just like you physically invest your energy into the workout and you invest of yourself and kind of like give up strength to gain more strength down the road. So too, might you invest money invest energy whether that's you know paying for ads and you know taking a slight loss temporarily because it's the long you know term right whatever that whether that's over days or weeks or months that eventually it comes back with a return mm -hmm. so it's that slingshot effect it's like wait i'm you know people think i'm losing money right mm -hmm. if you're only focused on the short term just like i'm losing strength i, I can't do this work i'm working out to get stronger but i'm mm -hmm. losing strength well mm -hmm. no that's just because you haven't seen the bigger picture and so it takes that that bigger picture mindset uh in business yeah so that brings up the acos and how most people you know are just focused on the acos amazon cost of sale the percentage on the right side of the dashboard and how do you feel about that one yeah, so as 
Um, again, it's, it's going to be understanding your business and the different pieces going to it. So if an author only has one book and they don't have a lot going on on the back end and different things, then it's great, I think, to get a, a profit just on the ads or at least break even because you're building your readership base. Uh, so I generally like to see profit on the ACOS. So if I have, you know, uh, if I can get it under 50%, even under 30%, there's ways to tweak it and get it under like 5% I've seen. The, oh. the trade-off with that is <laughs> you just might not be making as many sales overall. Mm -hmm. Okay, So one thing to keep in mind is, you know, if I put in a dollar and get $10 back, mm -hmm. that's a, you know, 10% ACOS or $10 in sales when I actually yeah. keep in rolls. Um, great. So that's, you know, that's a pretty, pretty good ROI. But let's say I could only do that once a month. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an extra, let's say I keep $7 and I put in a dollar, that's an extra $6 a month. That's just not that significant. <laughs> but if I put in $500 and get a thousand dollars in sales, and maybe I only keep 700 of that. Um, now all of a sudden I'm getting an extra $200 yeah. a month. So the ACOS would show very differently. I mean, it, it, I guess it'd be like a 50% ACOS in that second scenario, mm -hmm. but the actual total revenue generated and profit uh, could be much greater. Now, one caveat, if you don't know how Amazon ads works, the money that they show you you get uh, mm -hmm. is based off of book sales totals. And so yeah. you got to factor in how much do you actually keep in royalties. Exactly. That could be 35 to 70% for each Kindle sale. That could be, you know, probably... Yeah. I don't know, 40, 50% for the print edition. It could be less. It could be more depending on how you, how you price it. Yeah. But um, that's one thing that you got to factor in mind. So that's one thing. Uh, that's the first point. The other thing is that, okay, let's say you look like you're kind of breaking even or taking a slight loss on the ad for that book. But then you go, well, the sales of this book lead to sales of other books. The sales of this book uh, mm -hmm. lead to people signing up for my email list, which leads to offering other books, courses, services, uh, different things like that, merchandise, whatever it is. That's where you got to look at the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And um, for instance, when running, when when businesses run Facebook ads for, let's say, a, a training course or to a sales page or something like that, they often might take a loss on the front end, as it's called, like on the initial thing that they're offering. Yeah. This get this free book, just pay $7.99 shipping or just pay seven bucks for this ebook or something like that. Mm -hmm. But then they have things on the back end, the upsells, and that increases the overall order value. And that's, you know, when you get that right. high enough, that's how they can run ads and actually make a profit. Yeah. So for nonfiction authors, um, I guess it's important to have the whole sales funnel and the back end set up. And yeah, like you said, the customer lifetime value, you can take a loss in the initial book or whatever it is, and then down the road, you they spend more money in the funnel or the back end. And uh, have you also noticed, um, like you just said, you know what? Uh, okay, you can get it down to five percent ACOS, and uh, uh, that happens to me a lot with my print books. You know, I get these phenomenal, you know, five percent. Yeah, but it was only one book, and then and then the sales just just stop. And so. Um, it's crazy. So, uh, why is that? Or should I raise my bids or should, um, because then, uh, yeah, that was the lifetime of the ad was one or two sales at like 5%, but yeah. Okay. Two books. You know? <laughs> yeah. Of course it depends on your goals, but for me personally, <coughs> I would, I would, I want to raise it, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, just seeing that incredible ACOS again, I go, yeah, great ACOS, great ROI percentage, However, it's just not the the total volume because the thing with Amazon is it's not like you can just raise the daily budget and they're automatically going to spend it. If yeah. that were the case, yeah. you know, if you were getting 5% ACOS and you just say, okay, great, let's just turn this up by 100 each day yeah. or whatever, yeah. like awesome, then it, then it would make sense to do that. But you don't have, it's not like infinitely scalable. There's, yeah. there's a bit of a limit. So you're balancing mm -hmm. getting a good ROI with just the total um, revenue and profit that you get. I've had uh, the experience that I've bumped up my budget to a thousand dollars and it had almost zero effect. So the CPC had an effect, but the budget, have you had the same, uh, experience? The budget almost makes no difference. 
the budget only makes a difference once you're actually spending up to that that budget. So if you're only spending, you know, a dollar a day, let's say, um, then raising the budget from a dollar to five dollars to ten dollars to twenty to a hundred or a thousand, it's not going to matter. You're only spending. Mm -hmm. Amazon's only spending a dollar a day based on your bids and based mm -hmm. on the keywords that you have and how many and, and so on and so forth. So yeah. Yeah, raising the budget only comes into account once you've actually maxed that budget out. Interesting, interesting. Because I know everybody's always complaining. Oh, Amazon won't spend my budget. You know. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, imagine if you had one keyword mm -hmm. and it was not very popular, and yeah. like five people search for it a day. Like, let's say that was a campaign mm -hmm. that someone did. Yeah. Okay, so they have it. Like, if only five people are searching for it, and you know, maybe one person clicks on it a day uh, and you bid 10 cents, right? Mm -hmm. You can only spend 10 cents. What is Amazon's algorithm going to do? Like you told it to only target that one keyword that only gets on average one click a day. Yeah. Uh, unless you make the, your bid like $10 for that, even then, if it's not a very competitive keyword. So Amazon's algorithm is going based off of what you give it. And so if you you know, if you're giving it keywords that aren't as popular and if you're lowering the bid on them and, and things like that, um, then, then fine. Now you could force them to raise, to spend more each day just by putting in more keywords and jacking up the bid. But that's not always the smartest idea because if you just are like, I want to spend more money just for the sake of spending more money, but those <laughs> aren't actually profitable keywords. If it's not actually leading to sales, yeah, yeah you'll get Amazon. To, you can make Amazon spend 20, 50 bucks a day um, yeah. just by, raising the bids up and putting a ton in but mm -hmm. you might barely make any sales from that and then you're just throwing money down the drain yeah so what is your number one tip or 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 strategy do you have one for amazon ads uh, let's see number one tip i mean i would say uh definitely target a lot of different keywords at least at first mm -hmm. that would be uh, this is it's the throw spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks yeah um and when i when i teach my students and i have a training um mm -hmm for this is it's it's a process that you take people through it's a process like when i run ads for myself when i run ads for clients or when i teach students how to run ads it's like there's a series of steps there's a series of tests mm -hmm. that i go through it's not like i expect sometimes the first ad does amazingly well but even if the first ad does amazingly well my next ad i'm testing something to see if it'll do even better uh, but mm -hmm. sometimes the first ad doesn't do amazingly well. It's not a big deal. I go, okay, I learned something from this. I need to adjust the bids. I need to do this or that with the um, with the campaign. And it's it's a refinement process. So you get more data to work with when you put in a a lot of keywords, at least a couple hundred keywords up to you know you go up to a thousand uh, keywords in a campaign. Mm -hmm. So you know two hundred to a thousand keywords is of different types. Uh, not just very minor variations because they often use, you can use broad targeting. So it's, you know, just the slight changes aren't going to make that much of a difference. Hmm. Uh, so when you have all of that, that's going to give you some more data. It's going to let you spend a little bit more, get you more impressions and more clicks potentially. And then from there, you can, you might discover some keywords that get sales that maybe you didn't expect. Um, yeah. And so another tip that I teach my students is to target maybe some some different types of keywords than what you would expect. Uh, so, you know, someone's in historical romance. Well, you don't have to just do historical romance. You can do more broad types of romance because um, Amazon's partly going to target based on relevancy. Uh, hmm. The other thing is, like, people might not just be searching in that exact genre who might also still be interested in your book. And I give a, I give a nonfiction example. Like if you have a business book, you could do a lot of different categories of business. You could do um, personal development books because people in business might read personal development or um, you know things like that. So it doesn't have to be like just limited to keywords directly related to your category or your type of book. You can think it's a little bit more lateral thinking and, and going, okay, what are other types of books um, readers might be checking out that they would also be interested in my book, even if it's not in exactly the same genre. Right. I give one more uh, kind of example, like if I have a health and fitness book. I might use like coconut oil as a, as a keyword, right? It doesn't matter if my book's on coconut oil. If people are searching for like coconut oil and herbal remedies and different things like that, 
and I have a weight loss book, right? That's, it's kind of cross related in a certain way. And and that's just the type of thinking to come Mm -hmm. up with some more keywords. Yeah. So maybe, um, what do you do when, okay, you had a successful ad and then it stops working. So there's this thing called the law of diminishing returns and audience exhaustion. So I have a book that like that and every successive ad is less successful. And so, okay, I've been trying to, new keywords and stuff. And, and I don't know, what do you do when the ad stops working? Well, first thing is identify what, um, why an ad might not be working, mm-hmm. right? So, um, there's always the factor with Amazon ads and not necessarily specific for you, Eric, but just for everyone listening yeah. that you want to factor in um, that ads can get you traffic and clicks, but it's all ultimately up to your, your book sales page to determine, you know, whether it leads to a sale. Right. So there's many authors who, who I can see it sometimes gets a lot of clicks, but it, it doesn't lead to a lot of sales. Well, mm-hmm. if it's getting a lot of clicks, the ads are doing their job. Yeah. Um, but it could be something on the sales page, the reviews, the description, the cover, the title, these things aren't, mm-hmm. aren't working as well. Another factor could be maybe the sales page is good, but where the clicks are coming from, uh, it's not as relevant, right? Hmm. So some people are clicking on the book thinking it's one thing, but it ends up being not what they expected. Uh, so that could cost yeah. money. I think we right? talked about the um, that in the first podcast uh, where you got into that, the ABCs and the hooks for books. Uh, I think we got into the ABCs of the sales page. Was that uh, sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it might have been. I can give the, the very quick rundown. Yeah, uh, that's your cool. title. Uh, this is more nonfiction kind of advice, how-to books, but right. you know, first and foremost, uh, grabs attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, that's true for fiction, nonfiction, anything. You got to get a person's attention before you know, they're going to stop and check it out. Yeah. Um, second thing is it's believable, at least believable enough that they'll check it out. Um, so if it's like how to make a million dollars overnight, some people are just going to skim past that because it's like so unbelievable. <laughs> uh, so it's something that they care about, uh, it's a topic that they care about, they, something they find interesting, something that they find helpful. Uh, it's going to solve a problem for them. It's going it, to you know, ease their pain, help them gain pleasure. Now yeah. in fiction, it's, you know, does this look like the genre that I'm into? Um, and a lot of that's handled by the cover, actually. Mm-hmm. And then D is—is is, is it different? Uh, it doesn't have to be totally different. It doesn't have to be the only book on on its subject because that's actually a little scary if it's the only book out there. Because then I'm like, are people even wanting to buy this topic? Uh, but it's different enough that it just doesn't blend in as like a generic book. That's just a kind of a, a copycat type of thing. Um, yeah, so those are factors that are going to affect the the conversions. And then uh, to the other part of the ads, if they stop performing. Um, could be, you can try a few different things. You can change the ad text, uh, Mm -hmm. can, can do one thing. Um, another thing is, uh, I mean, cover ties into the book sales page too, but it also applies to the ad because that's the one, one of the things that they'll see on the ad. Um, and then, but as far as like a, a quick change would then be, you know, changing your bid and, you know, testing different bids, you know, any new keywords or things that you can put in. Uh, all of those things can be uh, some things to test. Okay. Is it possible to test A, B, test Amazon ads? Uh, well, like I said, I would recommend doing a like a test for a week or two and then just making one tweak and then testing mm-hmm. it again for a week or two. Okay. So I mentioned you could do that with bid, bid plus and no bid plus. You could also do that with uh, a certain, you know, the text for your ad, right? A little ad blurb. You could do one blurb for a week and then another blurb for the second week. Mm-hmm. Some people might do them at the same time, and I just I'm cautious about that because I don't know what kind of interference there might be with with two ads running at the same time yeah. for the, the same book. So I tend to test them separately. Okay. What? Well, uh, quick time check. How much time you got left? Uh, I got another five ten minutes. Okay, I'll take 10. <laughs> okay, is it true? Now, I heard this. I don't remember where. Is it true that if you send traffic from Facebook to your book's sales page in Amazon, uh, and, and a lot of people don't buy, right? So that the Amazon's algorithm might punish your book because of a bad conversion rate. So, you know, I heard that they like it when you send traffic to their website, you know, thanks for the traffic. But then if the people you send there don't buy Amazon's algorithm might punish your book in the rankings yeah so I don't know uh, what Amazon's 
actual algorithm does. So this is, I, I don't have any sort of definite answer for that. Okay. What I would say is if I were Amazon, um, I would actually say that would make a lot of sense for them to do. Uh, because mm -hmm. if you think about what Amazon's part of their agenda is to maximize sales. Yep. And they, I feel like I, I have heard somewhere that they, they certainly show things based off of relevancy. I've seen that in a little Q and a thing, yeah. uh, at least with the ads. So they're showing it based off of relevancy and, if they want to maximize sales, why wouldn't they prioritize things that are getting a higher conversion and, and making a higher sale? That yeah. would only make sense. So from an author perspective, it might go, well, I'm sending them the traffic and it, are they going to punish me? Well, maybe I would also take on the, the, the mindset of, well, let's make sure my book really converts well uh, in general <clears throat> because that's, I mean, that's what you're going to want to do. That's why I focus so heavily on more than like the marketing tactics and the ads and these mm -hmm. different things, I'm very much like, does the book page convert? Because if it mm -hmm. does, um, whether Amazon rewards the flip side is, will they reward you if you convert well? Exactly. Right. And yeah. if so, then um, that's incentive. <laughs> and hopefully, like hopefully you'd want to be incentivized to make sure your book is uh, compelling and that people uh, want to click on it and that you're only sending traffic to it to people who would um, who would actually be interested in that mm -hmm. type of book. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, we're going to have to get some behind the scenes. We're going to have to go to Amazon and, and uh, take some of their managers into the back room there and <laughs> get the goods, you know, <laughs> about the A9 algorithm. So um, what do you think is going to change in the book world and the advertising world? What I think is going to change, um, I'm a big fan of, and I have been for uh, a number of years, of what I think is going to be uh, one of the best opportunities for authors uh, coming up, especially as things get more and more competitive on, on Amazon with, with eBooks and print books. I think that's going to continue to get more um, competitive. The good news is you can always kind of uh, zig when people zag. <laughs> so what that means is, uh, audiobooks. Ah, great. yeah. I love, you know, I've, I've seen good results from my audiobooks that continue to sell and just not as many authors are going to be into it. The fact that there's a, a little bit of a barrier of entry mm -hmm. is perfect because yeah. that means if you get a book created as an audiobook, again, this isn't saying just put out an audiobook and it's automatically going to sell. It's got to mm -hmm. have a, a market for it. It's got to, you know, you want reviews, the conversion factors all, all are there. But at least from a, um, you search audible for a subject and you search Amazon for a subject, you're going to find more books on Amazon for any particular subject um, than you will on, on audible. So you have a little bit more um, advantage in that sense. So I think, uh, and then plus more and more people seem to be consuming audio, you know, with the podcast uh, yeah. continuing to boom, boom. Uh, you know, I mean, look at what we're doing right now, a podcast. Yep. So uh, audio is going to be um, even bigger. And then I would say, this is, this is, I mean, I want to say it's always somewhat the case, but it's going to be very much the case as we go forward that it's the, it's the authors and the entrepreneurs who are, know how to use the, the new currency hmm. as it's been called. Mm -hmm. uh, if people aren't using the new currency, uh, they don't have access to it, then um, I think a lot of them. Uh, they have been struggling or they're going to find that their businesses uh, eventually fail. And the new currency <laughs> is the currency of attention. Ah, it's, uh, it's, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk was just yep. listening to think like you're, there's only, there's only like one currency, one asset in, mm -hmm. in today's day and age it's attention. Yep. Right. And if you don't have a person's attention, as I mentioned, the A in the, in the uh, ABCD formula attention, because if someone's browsing Amazon, they see, now on a page 50 other books and on the the bestseller chart for that you know mm -hmm. per page uh you're in a carousel next to a bunch of other books being advertised you're in a carousel next to a bunch of other customers who also bought your book isn't showing up in a bubble and people are being bombarded more and more with ads with other books with all these things and it's gonna be the people who know how to get attention hmm. that are are going to be the ones that come out ahead and those who don't know how to get attention they're going to get swept away in the the sea of competition so knowing how to get a person's attention uh is going to be key 
the beautiful thing is like anything, like it's a double-edged sword. So it's just like the more people are trying one thing, again, that zig, the more people are zigging, yep. it actually becomes easier for you to zag and do something uh, a little bit different. So yeah, uh, I'll say that I can give one like really practical tip yeah. on paying attention. Um, not just to like bring up like, you know, it's hopeless if you don't know how to do this. And so good yeah. luck. Uh, I want to leave you empowered. So yeah. um, this is, this is not specifically just being on Amazon. This is reaching out to other authors. This is reaching out and informing connections. I'm a big fan of influencer marketing um, mm -hmm. or relationship marketing, connecting with other people, connecting with other authors. Um, and if you think about it, if an author has built a tribe, that author has that tribe's attention. People mm -hmm. listen to them. People respect them. So if you connect with them, you can you can tap into that. And of course, this takes providing value to them and and so on. So that's that's another part. But the first step of that was how do I get people's attention? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a real simple way, just one of multiple strategies, is I often like to record a personal video for mm -hmm. people and introduce myself. If I'm connecting with someone for the first time, I will s record just a one to two minute video introducing myself, letting them know what I appreciate about their work, why I'm connecting, offering to do that. Now, it's not a hundred percent that they're all going to respond to me, mm -hmm. but you know, can you imagine how how many people do you think send? I mean, I don't know for you, Eric. Um, mm -hmm. Do you get emails on occasion from people like connecting to you about about stuff just in general? Yeah, and it's crazy because they send emails like you know. Oh, I'm I'm the student of so and so. Connect me with an editor. You know, it's like, hey, hello. Who are you? You know. <laughs> yeah. And so you get emails like that. How many of them send you a personal video introducing? Oh, zero. Uh, zero. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But you know what? The funny thing is, I'm like, it takes me less time to just hit record and shoot a quick video than it probably would for me to like sit there and type out this whole whole email. So we're not talking yeah. about things that are necessarily complicated. We're not talking about things that are time consuming. We're talking about just being now that D part of the ABCD mm -hmm. formula, just being a little different. Just yeah. all that's all it takes. And of course, connecting with someone on a personal level, not just going in with, can you do this for me? Uh, you know, can you can you give me something? It's you know, coming in with that that service mindset and the the value giving. But again, that's that's part of it. Definitely you gotta have that part. But again, before you even get to that, uh, if if I get an email too from someone, I'm like, who is this? What and it, it just we have these filters that instantly go, does this kind of seem like spam or just a, you know, marketing yeah, message yeah. or whatever, or is this like, Oh, this is a real person. Hey, Eric, you know, I, I listened mm -hmm. to your podcast the other day. It was great. I took this away from you, you know, like, Oh wait, this is a real human being who didn't, isn't just sending out this mass message to a bunch of people. Oh, they're, they're actually connecting. And just that little thing. It's so yeah. simple, but that's, one of the the ways that you can stand out you can uh you can grab attention and of course just taking that principle now mm -hmm. um you know so i'm not just saying it's recording a video is the only way that's yeah, just yeah. one practice the principle is how do i stand out how do i get a person's attention and you know how do i connect now on in a world where connection personal connection yeah is is being lost due to the the digital medium and something as simple as oh it's a video it's a uh, a piece of mail in the mailbox now, and <laughs> where? Well, someone sent me a thank you card in the mail. Like it's <laughs> that went out of style years ago, but now it's <laughs> back again because yeah. it's different uh, yeah. and and isn't done as much. That's a really good tip. Yeah, thinking out of the box. So you send him an email with a video. Yeah, I just I mean. The technical part of it is I'll, I could upload to YouTube and make it unlisted. I use Vimeo now, though, oh, yeah. so just a, a Vimeo mm -hmm. video or whatever. Yeah, there's different – and there's um, – I think it's BombBomb uh, mm -hmm. is the name of a service uh, that does this as well. So, I mean, there's resources uh, out there. Okay. Well, my friend, I respect your time. So just um, what's on the horizons for you now? Isn't, wasn't there something about Katie's sales machine or something? Yeah, so I we still offer my KD sales machine uh, training. So if you um, if you have a link for that or something that you want to include in the yeah. show notes, uh, you can get that in there. And then I have done a little bit of a done for you service, but it's not currently open. Okay. Uh, so, but I'll, I'm testing that, and if it's, I've had some good results so far. Uh, so 
if that continues and is something I want to do, then uh, that might be something I open up wider. But for sure, anyone can uh, can get the training Katie Sales Machine to learn more about how to do Amazon ads yourself. Okay, just one more real quick, because I love the email you sent me about the 4% rule. Can you sum it up real quick? Sure thing. So the 4%, um, if you've ever been into a flow state, mm -hmm. like a state where you're just immersed in something and your brain is firing on all cylinders and you, you know the creativity is, is coming out, your, your brain's just giving you what you need. And that could be in, in writing, it could be in a physical performance. Uh, for me, it's been when playing music, uh, you know, just these different flow states. What they find is that it's when you're 4% like beyond your, uh, your current ability. You know, you might think 4% of a stretch of your comfort zone. Okay. Yeah. So if you're saying right where you're comfortable, um, it's easy to just kind of like go on autopilot and just kind of zone out and zombie like just get through the work i mean think about like driving a car after you're if you're really good at driving a car like not when you're first learning but once you're good you could drive for like like wait i don't even remember going through the last three stoplights i don't even remember this last half mile that i've been driving and it's just like zoned out but you yeah. know on autopilot right that's in your comfort zone if you stretch yourself too much like really think about it and it's kind of stressful and and uh, and can be overwhelming but if you're just that little bit beyond your capacity Mm -hmm. Right. And now you can't really measure what 4% is, but it's more of a feeling type of thing. Yeah. Then that's when you enter that, that flow state. And so mm -hmm. in that email, the practical tip I, I gave is the theme was money, love, speed, <laughs> which is a whole nother topic of conversation. But when I gave myself deadlines and when I'm like, I'm going to get this done, I'm going to write this email, I'm going to write this chapter, I'm going to get this book done in this shorter period of time. Yeah. Um, then that, that challenge, it kind of forced me to just like lock in mm -hmm. and, and just like activate something. So I give myself yeah. too much time, I can overthink it and yeah. I get too logical. And and so by actually cr cr creating constraints for yourself <laughs> yeah. uh, at the right amount that can actually enhance creativity and enhance your productivity. Mm -hmm. Where some people think, well, if I give myself a deadline, it's going to be lower quality work. Well, sure, if it's too tight of a deadline, you can go too far. Uh, just like you can lift too heavy of a weight and injure yourself, uh, but not any sort of deadline uh can kind of leave things too open there's not enough like healthy pressure if you will uh to really you know challenge your brain yeah. to have to lock in and uh and stretch it so that's yeah. that's the four percent and uh just one of the practical ways of doing that is giving yourself some deadlines whether that's on a project to get a book done mm -hmm. or whether that's on a, in a work session like hey i'm going to give myself just you know, 15, 30 minutes to, to write this article or email. And mm -hmm. it's all, it all depends on your current ability. If it normally takes you two hours and you give yourself 15 minutes, that might be too much, but yeah. if it normally takes you two hours and you're like, I'm going to give, I'm going to, you know, see if I can do this in an hour and a half. I'm going to really like kind of push myself. Now that's a 25% um, change, but you might have found that many times two hours is just way too long anyway. And you're actually yeah. capable of doing things um, a lot a lot more than maybe you, you give yourself credit for until you challenge yourself in that way. Yeah, that email uh, resonated with me right away. I got it right away, too. And another way to say it is take on bigger problems, you know. But um, okay, anyway, I respect your time. And the KD sales machine, I know you've helped some big guns with their Amazon ads, like Steve Scott and stuff like that. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that might have been back in the day. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, I don't know how much, I think Steve's handled a lot of his, his uh, stuff yeah. now, but yeah, a number of people have gone through the KD sales machine training that helped them uh, get going with their ads. Uh, Patrick King, uh, yeah. he's got a lot going. Um, Ari Witten. Yep. So some of the people that, uh, you know, have, have had some great results with the, with the ads. Okay. So Amazon ads training, KD sales machine. Derek, it's been real. Thank you so much. I want to reserve you for audiobooks, uh, a deep dive on that and then deep dive on 4% rule, all of that stuff for the next podcast. All right. Sounds good, Eric. All right. Take it easy in Los Angeles, my friend. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye. So I, oops, I, I hit the button and uh, yeah.